Okay, good afternoon everybody. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, so welcome back to everybody in the room. We've had a session this morning, but now we've been joined by um, online participants in this, which is day two of the Aquavitae Scientific Conference. This hybrid event has been held here at ATU in Galway, Ireland physically, and as I've mentioned, people are joining us now online. So this is day two. I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction for those who are joining that weren't with us yesterday. Uh, my name is Phil James. I'm the coordinator of the Aquavitae project. I work at uh, a research institute called Nafima, based in Tromsø in the north of Norway. And it's uh, an absolute pleasure to welcome you back to this second day of the Aquavitae um, scientific conference. What are we doing in Aquavitae? We are unlocking the potential of sustainable, low trophic aquaculture in the Atlantic, um, working on a raft of different species and different processes. Uh, these are just some of the species we work in. Um, this is a very short version of, of the presentation yesterday, really for the benefit of those uh, that weren't with us then. The different value chains that we address in Aquavitae are macroalgae, IMTA, echinoderm shellfish and finfish, and within each of those we have some very specific case studies, at least two, three in some cases. And we spent a lot of time yesterday going into the detail of these research areas or case studies within the value chains. So I invite you to, this will be, this has been recorded, it's going to be online on the, on the Aquavitae website, you can go in if you're interested in the more hands-on work within those value chains and within the case studies, then please go back and take a look at the very interesting presentations from yesterday. Today we're going to focus more on the cross-cutting value chain research areas of Aquavitae. That includes uh, technological uh, advances in the, uh, in, in the case of sensors and IT platforms, uh, product characteristics, consumer attitudes, attitudes towards them and market potential, uh, sustainability, what sustainability is, how we monitor it and what risk assessments are necessary. The financial side of aquaculture, uh, the analysis of the value chains themselves, profitability and business cases, and we're going to spend some time looking at policy and governance. Across that, we have these communication, dissemination and education cross-cutting areas, so we'll also look at that. I'm not going to go into detail of uh, the presentations. Everybody in the room I know has the agenda in front of them, and the agenda is online as well. But uh, through the course of this afternoon, the next three hours, we'll be covering all of those topics that I've just mentioned. So once again, I just want to welcome you. I also want to uh, reiterate that if you find something this afternoon interesting and you want to find out more, you're very, very welcome to contact me or contact me and I'll put you in contact with the person, uh, a relevant person. All come on our website, there's a lot of information there, you'll see um, these QR codes throughout the talks today. Um, all this information is available uh, online or contact us directly. So once more welcome, I'm very excited to hear about the, uh, the different topics that are presented this afternoon. And I should also introduce Colin Hannon from ATU, he is going to be the moderator this afternoon so I will hand the floor over to Colin and he will introduce the first session and speaker. Colin. I am the first speaker. Well, the first speaker. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome again to ATU. So I'm Colin Hannon. I'm the moderator for this afternoon, and we also have our online moderator, Joao. So Joao will monitor the chat, and we'll monitor everything else that's going on. So... Um, <clears throat> Thanks for everyone for coming, and I hope everyone enjoyed their walking tour yesterday evening, which I'm going to use as a nice little analogy today to start off the event. So, you know, we've been speaking about a consortium for the last four and a half years, if not more, but realistically what we are is actually a transatlantic community. We're a community of people that are sharing information, sharing knowledge, sharing experiences, and sharing uh, stories, rumours, and uh, anything else that's saucy. But... Um, we're going to start here. This is the long walk in Galway. So you would have heard last night about <clears throat> basically how people would have traversed the Atlantic, 
north, south, and east and west with the transfer of goods and services throughout uh, the Middle Ages and how Galway was a mecca for the transportation of um, wine and olive oil and nice things from continental Europe. And Christopher Columbus apparently got his idea of traveling to America from traveling to Galway when he had read a very, book, a very good book written by a man called St. Brendan. So the Atlantic, you think, in one sense, is not actually a barrier. And one, at one time, it was actually the avenue for people to transverse um, nations and actually cross the Atlantic. And we're using the Atlantic now uh, not as a barrier, but we're using it in the same way. But we're traveling slightly differently, but what we're actually trading is innovation. We're tra trading expertise and we're trading experience. <clears throat> and I suppose when we look at, um, I suppose, the main thing of why we're actually here. So Aquavite, as you know, it's, uh, it was a part of the blue growth. Um, and I suppose it's over under the overall research alliance for the Atlantic. And we have sister projects under different calls within this. And the two ones that really kind of link quite well together are Aquavite and the Astral Project. We've, all of us here have shared um, outputs or tasks or other innovations with the Astral Project over the duration of Aquavite. And we've all been involved in other projects that have been linked to Aquavite or the Astral Project. So, you know, these two projects link quite well. And I suppose in one sense, we're primarily looking at, I suppose, IMTA, we're looking at eutrophic aquaculture, we're looking at trying to advance understanding and the ability for both commercial organizations, research organizations, and communities to actually implement um, good practice recommendations, um, good innovations, and actually attain and realize the potential that can be used from eutrophic aquaculture. So Lucas and Cliff are actually going to speak a bit more, I suppose, about the impact of this on the ground in both of their respective regions. I'm just going to kick off with kind of speaking about overall how we are. Um, we have 35 uh, different partners. We have 15 different countries. You know, it's massive. This project is absolutely massive and the amount of effort that's come out of it. And you can see from the different deliverables that are ranging from 23 or 24 pages up to 900 pages of information that's coming out of the project on an annual basis. Um, <coughs> So here's another nice example of a nice wet, rainy Galway where we have a community of people. This is part of our consortium. So we have people from different respected areas. We didn't get a picture of the other group that attended. There was the other guide. But, you know, this was a nice event to show people Galway and uh, show, um, I suppose, the networking and ability that's there. Secondly to that as well, I suppose we're contributing to the Bellum Statement. We're contributing to the Galway Statement. And I suppose we're trying our best to engage beyond the consortium level to the community because at this stage now we're we're not just consortium partners we're more than likely friends so it's a case of that's what we're going to kick off but the thing is that we've had we've had really big events over the years like aquaculture europe so the astral project and aquavita chaired the imt se mta session for aquaculture europe this year in vienna we've presented at the european maritime day on successive years um, we've presented, Phil has presented the Galway Statement. So this is the, this year is the 10th anniversary of the Galway Statement, which is one of the fine, founding principles, I suppose, of the Aquavita Project. It is one of the main statements and one of the main things that we contribute towards. And it's the transatlantic transfer of knowledge and innovation. And it's basically the agreement and the accord that supports that. And that's basically my introduction of, I suppose, what Aquavita is, it was a small kind of point of view of where we are in Ireland and on the West Coast and the fringes of the Atlantic. So I can introduce our first speaker now, which is Cliff Jones. So whenever he's ready, we can get him down. Oh, sorry, Lucas is first. Sorry. <laughs> Great, so Lucas is from Emperba in Brazil. Yes. yes. Yeah, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lucas Torati from Embrapa. I'm going to share with you a little bit of the Brazilian perspective of what uh, Aquavita was for our institutions. Uh, first of all, a table showing how wide was the contribution of the Brazilian institutions to Aquavita project? We basically participated in uh, several case studies, case study one, five, eight, 10, 11, 13, and almost all of the work packages. So this was uh, a big learning for us. Uh, also, uh, it was a big learning to know, uh, to combine the different 
bureaucracies that uh, different institutions have with European bureaucracy. So it was uh, a very good learning, <laughs> uh, <laughs> very challenging to deal with this, and uh, we made it. That's the big thing, we made it. Uh, another important thing was that industry was always close to everything that was developed. And I bring here some uh, very nice example of uh, an industry participation, which was Primar. Primar uh, uh, had a very, very good uh, experience. She, Marcia, uh, told me uh, two weeks ago, she had like several technologies transferred to her, to her industry. And she, this was uh, enabled her to increase production a lot and diversify the products that she was uh, uh, producing. And uh, from her mouth, I heard that uh, Aquavita was a watershed in the, in the company. So this was uh, very, very nice to hear. Uh, some examples of uh, uh, interchange, exchange, uh, scientific exchange was between also Embrapa and Ofima, uh, working uh, close together to develop a protocol for triploids of Tambaqui, between Embrapa and IVL uh, to develop and evaluate uh, alternative techniques and new protocols for collection of wild uh, spot for oysters. Several uh, student exchanges, some of, uh, of them you have seen this morning. Uh, I will not uh, I'll read here, just I will pass some slides because we, we saw all of them this morning. So uh, Mayara from uh, UNESP, uh, uh, Patricia was uh, her, her supervisor. Uh, staff who presented this morning as well. Fernando Silva, and uh, also uh, something that uh, we need to emphasize was the massive contribution of the Brazilian institutions to publications in Macrovita. Uh, we also received everybody in Florianópolis this year, which was a fantastic meeting, I heard, because I wasn't there, I couldn't, unfortunately. My son broke his arm and I couldn't be there. I was a week before for the conference. And uh, from this, uh, we honestly expect that this uh, goes on and that the collaboration that we have established in Aquavita can continue and we can find other opportunities of projects to keep what we have done uh, so far. Uh, that's, that's it. Thank you, everybody. A big thanks. A big thanks from Brazil to all. Okay, we'd like to welcome Cliff from Rhodes University, South Africa. I've just been told I can talk for 20 minutes, so I'm going to, I'm going to, <laughs> no, um, I won't be keeping you for 20 minutes, but it would be very, very out of place if I didn't start off this talk by going right back to the very, very, very beginning of Aquavita. So I'm going to take you back, because I've got 20 minutes, to 2019, and within a month, of starting Aquavita, <laughs> that happened in Japan. <laughs> just, just saying. 2019. No, 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 no. The project didn't start before 2019. It started in 2019. Anyway, I, I couldn't start the talk without pointing this out. Um, it was an amazing day. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Um, same year, 2019, um, this was the South African group that um, joined you all in, in Tromsø. Um, all the South African representatives are, are there. Um, unfortunately, not in this photograph is not quite South African, but our, our colleagues from UNAM 
um, were also um, present then. I'm afraid I didn't have the photograph, and I'm sorry. But um, not quite South Africa, but, but close enough. Um, so we had four partners in South Africa. Um, you've seen this, 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 this map slightly earlier today, just to put it into perspective so you can see where we all came from. Um, there was Rhodes University, where I'm from, um, in, in Makanda. And um, then there's Stellenbosch University, um, down close to Cape Town. And um, then there's Wild Coast Abalone. And, um, and I just want to point out, I'm not going to go into any more detail because you've already heard from um, Richard earlier today, but the impact that this project, the actual innovation that took place in this project, um, has already changed the way part small ways in which um, um, this company, this partner does its business, okay? And, and the same goes for Marifeed. Um, two products that are already on the market um, and a process, by the way, which they've changed the way in which they make their product biosecure when they include algae um, in their diet as a result of the work done in Aquavita. It's already commercialized. So from a South African industry point of view, you've heard about it earlier today in more detail, but massive, massive impact. Um, so as a project as a whole, I think we engaged with every single partner because we were on the project management team. Um, I was the work package two leader, and I think just about everybody contributed to, to work package two. Um, Rhodes University also um, took the lead in, in C-based IMTA. You heard about it earlier, so we worked very closely with a number of, of partners just on that one case study. And um, then all of the South African partners were involved in um, a large number of the case studies across the project, which was absolutely awesome. I haven't listed all of the, the work packages here. Um, but that's us also, 2019, right at the beginning, our kickoff meeting, we were very, very lucky that we got in just before COVID and we had a group meeting and I think that changed the way in which we were able to operate and do research um, in our various case studies because, because we got together early, thank goodness, um, we got to know each other and, um, and there was common design, there was common um, um, uh, experimental work and planning um, that we were able to implement right through, through COVID. Uh, so I don't have a picture of everybody, but I think all the institutions, I hope, are represented here. But there was a, there was a lot of a collaboration that took place between the South Africans and between um, the uh, pa partners from other parts of the world. So unfortunately, not everybody's picture is up there because I don't have a picture of everybody, but, but at least all the institutions are up there. So, yeah, um, South Africa, France, Spain, the Faroe Islands, Norway, um, Germany isn't in that list. Sorry, should be in the list. Um, but a large, I've just listed uh, just some of the themes that took place um, during the collaboration. Um, I'm not going to read it out. You can see them up there. Uh, but as I was saying just now, it was... Um, because we got together and planned, there was, uh, there, there was a coordinated and, uh, and shared approach to the experiments that we designed, um, which resulted in more reliable, more globally applicable. Um, and, and the outcomes had, really, they had um, a much greater impact as a result of this. Uh, in addition to uh, the innovative work, we had some exchanges. Um, Anne Wu, who most of you know because she was if you were involved in case study, I mean, work package two at all, and one, two, and three, actually, she helped all of us. Um, you would have got to know her online very, very well. But she was also part of the international ex exchange. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to be here. We were hoping she'd be able to join us for this meeting, but unfortunately not. Um, um, Dr. Nico Mabaza is with us, and she also um, formed part of the exchange. And you listened to her a little bit earlier today. Um, so the, the, we had also contributed to the MOOC. Actually, it was Nico that um, contributed on our behalf um, a, a lot to the MOOC. Um, and I think we contributed to about three of the, of the, of the MOOC um, sections of the MOOC. Um, and then there was the traveling and getting to know you guys um, 
at, at, at various different events. Um, so these are just some of them. And um, there, were, there were others actually in between, um, more informal ones as well. But, but the South Africans um, represented Aquavita with other people from Aquavita at all of the events that you see up here. So for me, and I know I, I talk on behalf of all the South Africans when I say this, but this was an absolutely an incredible learning experience for all of us. Um, uh, Lucas said it earlier as well. I think you guys do things slightly differently. We had to learn how you did things. You probably saw how we did things as well. But, and I know that the impact that it's had on me personally is that I'll never be doing things quite the same as I did before I came into this project as a result of the interactions that I've had and I've learned from all of you guys. Um, and I'm pretty sure I speak the same when I, uh, you know, I can say the same for all the South Africans. So a very, very big thank you from us for making it possible for us to be a part of, of this project. Um, so I think, what do we take out of this? Yeah, masses innovation, we've already, um, um, uh, commercialized uh, and, and exploited some of the innovation that's taken place. But, but I think the relationships and the partnerships um, in research um, and in industry that have been developed as part of this program will, without question, outlive this project. So, um, yeah, really, so on behalf of, of all of the South Africans, we had an absolutely awesome time. Now, I would have put up many more pictures, but I had to limit it to these kind of pictures and I only had so many, so if you aren't on there, I'm really sorry. But um, here's a small selection of pictures that really shows how much fun we had um, in this project, really. So, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think I'm gonna print this up and put it on my office wall. <laughs> Um, anyhow, uh, I started off at the very beginning in 2019, and I, I can't end my talk without <laughs> pointing out that, that this entire project was flanked by two World Cup wins. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, and thanks for the pictures, Cliff. Amazing. Um, Rosa from Setmar, would you like to come up? And Rosa is going to introduce uh, basically our workshop that we had earlier today um, strengthening stakeholder engagement in low tofu aquaculture. Thank you, Colin. I'm Rosa Chapella from Setmar. Probably the people uh, in this room know perfectly what we talk uh, about this morning, early this morning in the stakeholder event, but for the people online, we are going to summarize uh, the seminar uh, this morning. And especially the work that said that um, the World Package 9 and all the people involved in it, in Aquavite, developed uh, taking care of and involved and engaged the stakeholders in the project. Um, for us, uh, the Aquavite pro uh, project places a great emphasis on, on stakeholder engagement as a cornerstone on its success. The project recognizes the transformative power on it of involving a diverse range of stakeholders from uh, policymakers, researchers, NGOs, and students or consumers in researching activities and decision-making decision processes. By actively involving the stakeholders from various sectors, including the industry, and policies and use Aquavita enhance the relevance, impact, and sustainability of its outcomes for the traffic, low traffic aquaculture sector. They were really instrumental in, dri in driving deliverables, executive tasks, conducting tasks and tests, and participating in meetings. For instance, like the very important meeting uh, uh, led by uh, Sofia in the Digimare headquarters in Brussels, and so an active involvement from the different departments in the European Commission, along with dedicated also devoted stakeholder session in Brazil that we had. Um, the Aquavita stakeholder platform boosted a robust network of 205 participants from the Atlantic area. 
we engaged with them in various tasks for and for diverse uh, purposes. And during each annual meeting, we brought together stakeholders to discuss results and uh, highlight the collaboration, as uh, was uh, also highlighted here by Cliff Jones. And um, these interactions were closely tied to our dissemination and uh, communication activities with the stakeholders serving as the primary audience. In this meeting early this morning, we structured three panels, one focused on industry, the other focused on the and policy and the opportunities, and a third geared towards uh, young, uh, young people or early careers professionals. The involvement of this uh, research, down research people, has consistently uh, played a significant role in Aquavite across different tasks also. Low traffic experiences and good practices and challenges were shared from South African industries like White Coast Avalone and Marifit, Europe industry from Saliotis and Orsen Rainforest to Brazil with Aqua inspiration and innovation. And uh, all of them agreed on the key role of Aquavitae in their work, creating new products, new processes, or even sharing their challenges and how to address them in a collaborative way. They mentioned funding needs because, as Sylvain Nuchet from Franz Aliotis mentioned, they are not able to finance the research by themselves. And that's why he and others was grateful for Aquavitae's support and participation. Policy after Sofia Franco presentations or uh, some, with some policy recommendations provided by the Aquavitae team. Um, and um, also the panelists uh, highlighted that, uh, as David Bassett said, there are as many ways to legislate and regulate aquaculture as many countries we have. So all panelists agreed also on the needs for networking, exchange good practices on governance. We would like to highlight also the impact of the Aquavite project in the new and next South African legislation of aquaculture, as uh, Cliff Jones uh, mentioned, that will contend the low traffic aquaculture specifically. So the footprint in such a way, the footprint of Aquavita will be in such a way in this new law. And this is a result also of many cross-Atlantic meetings organized by Aquavita, DATIP, and policymakers where they um, debate on challenges of aquaculture governance in South Africa, in Brazil, and also Europe. This is now a good moment for low traffic aquaculture, for IMTA, due to the big European policies that promote the low traffic aquaculture but regulation barriers still exist, and we need to ask again how to overcome those barriers. For instance, with an adaptive legal framework, clear legislation and regulation and collaborative networks between Atlantic countries to join forces and lobbying to raise their voices. Together, we will be listening. Finally, the early careers presented their work in Aquavitae, so, as, um, as David Bassett also and all the panelists agreed, the future is now because they are already new generations working on sustainable aquaculture and already working to enhance sustainable aquaculture for the future. Thank you. Okay, we'd like to welcome Sophia from SAMS in Scotland, who's going to talk about um, policy and governance from the Aquavita project. that's okay online. Uh, thank you so much, Colin. Um, and it's me again. So most of you <laughs> know me and heard already part of our work uh, this morning, but I'll introduce myself again for those uh, watching this online. My name is Sofia Franco. I'm a 
a lecturer at the Scottish Association of Marine Science, and as part of we're good, yeah. Of this project, I was leading work package eight on policy and, and governance. So I'm not here actually representing myself. I'm representing a massive team, and I'm pretty sure I don't have everyone in there because. A lot of people across the project that were even not listed to work with us ended up working with us uh, quite a lot. And this has been a true team effort. So everything that I say here today comes from a lot of us together, as well as many stakeholders outside of the project that were consulted throughout. So thank you for all of those that contributed to this. Um, policy and governance within Aquavita. So we've done a lot of things. And there's no way that I can cover this in here. So what I thought I would do is start by signposting where things are. So in total, we produce five deliverables in there. You have, you have the link, so they're easy to find. They're all in the website. And we started by producing a, a report looking at the current frameworks legislating um, aquaculture. We then look at the industry perceptions of the frameworks um, itself. We then move to drawing some recommendations in terms of adaptiveness and governance. And our most recent work is what I'm gonna introduce today is our policy brief, which includes our recommendations, and, our, uh, and is also our recommendations for good practice and low traffic aquaculture and, and policy making. I highly recommend that you go online, have a browse. I know many people have already, which is, uh, which is great. If you wanna know more, please contact me or some of the main authors will be delighted to tell you more about this work. So we produced quite a lot of, of outputs throughout the project, but this year in particular has been a very, very busy year, not only listening to, to, to stakeholders and policy making, but also getting the, pro the messages out of, of the project. So we started early uh, in March where we had the meeting that Rosa just spoke about. We met at Digimare, there were several DGs uh, present. So there was Aquaculture Advisory Council, Mar Market Advisory Council. So quite a lot of people to discuss exactly the sort of things that we are talking about today. The policy issues and how we should uh, approach them. How should we address them? We took part on a policy session organized together um, with Astral now earlier in Vienna, Phil and I were a few weeks ago in Brussels contributing to the aquaculture special event, uh, drawing um, guidance for member states that uh, David has spoken about earlier. Eric had just come from a ministerial meeting in Brazil to also discuss those, those, these sorts of, um, of issues and our results on, on policies. And I've listed a policy workshop that is already in the pipeline. Uh, from Rosa, but apparently there's two or three other things already happening in, in November and December. So this is surely a list still to continue. And this is very important because producing deliverables or recommendations that don't get anywhere is quite pointless. Mm -hmm. So we actually need to create a, a movement and integrate this across uh, the different policies and have these discussions that can lead to wider change. So what I'm going to talk about today <laughs> because I didn't want to be over, uh, overly ambitious, is a simple introduction to our policy brief and to the recommendations that we have listed there. So you have a direct link to the policy brief following that, that QR code. And we try to keep it as simple as we possibly could. Uh, we wanted you to be able to, maybe not as ambitious as read it in your elevator ride, but certainly read it for breakfast. So it's a very short document, it's a four page, document, first page, just to highlight recommendations in the front, then a second page focusing on all um, the benefits where we had a massive contribution um, from our colleagues across different work packages on the environmental <laughs> value of low-trophic aquaculture, nutritional value, economic value, because we need to talk benefits. We discussed about this this morning, and it's really important to pass this message, message because people can sometimes have a limited view of what aquaculture is. Low traffic aquaculture can even be harder um, to explain. The policy brief then goes to cover just all the challenges that we identified throughout, which we know are um, common, and then closes with our recommendations that are gonna cover, I'm going to cover here today. 
<laughs> you will also hear quite a few of these topics come up in the presentations that follow uh, mine. So I know Ozo is certainly going to cover the sustainability. Owen is going to tell you a bit more about uh, the business aspect. So we are here to make this uh, information uh, available. So I now move to policy recommendations. We try to be as succinct as possible, and we still ended up with 15 policy recommendations. So bear with me. If I run out of breath, you know what happened. Um, 15 was the best that we could do, trying to really squeeze all the information we had um, from the project and draw a pathway forward. So recommendation number one, provide legal certainty to developers uh, with streamlined licensing. We talked about this quite a lot this morning, making it uh, a simple process. And this could be done through various, uh, various ways. Certainly, we need coordinating authorities to oversee the process, but it's about simplifying those administrative procedures, creating one-stop shops, having process timelines, so not allowing the process to go beyond um, a certain point. But it's also about building capacity in the services to actually take this forward, having advisors if, if, if needed. And it's then after you go through all of this, having a permit that is long enough for you to actually get a profit out of it. So long enough permits are a really key part um, in sustainably driving uh, aquaculture. Second point, diversify low traffic aquaculture with updated legal frameworks. So uh, there are, we've done quite a bit of work on the current uh, frameworks. Not all of them are fit for emergent sectors. Not all of them cover things like seaweed very well or IMTA very well. So they need updating and they need to become adaptive, especially if we are moving towards a, a much more dynamic circular economy type of approach. And we want people to be innovative and we want things to be integrated. Things like what we heard this morning about multi-species licenses and legislating for the sort of diversity in IMTA system, so going beyond your box standard expectation of what, what IMTA is, is important. And there needs to be that flexibility within policy to actually allow innovation um, to happen. But as we were hearing this morning too, the rules need to be there and they provide assurance for the producers if they protect the producers. Um, and we need those sorts of things on biosecurity, on offshore development, on, on algae, so that um, development can happen and it can happen in a, in a sustainable way. Third, looking at zoning and looking at area-based management. So a lot of countries are already going in this direction. They are looking at water body management skills. This is in looking at carrying capacity models and monitoring uh, that performance. So setting the rules in which um, development should happen in, in and what, what are the expectations within uh, given areas, setting indicators, setting thresholds. They're all in, important to make sure that things develop um, in, a, in a sustainable way uh, in the long term. Fourth, acknowledging the value to restoration and remediation. We, talked, uh, we touched upon this, I think, a couple of times yesterday too, because I was taking notes as we were going um, through it. Obviously, it's helpful to have uh, the areas of high potential designated for, for LTA, but we need to consider LTA as a nature-based solution. And a lot of times, this is not done. It just falls into that package of aquaculture that might not be seen as, as a solution. But we have several subsectors in here that are removing nutrients that can offer that restoration and bioremediation value, and that needs to be reflected um, in the way that we have uh, those, those legal frameworks in those, uh, those areas. And we also need a better coherence between policies and between the various nature management frameworks so that one is not blocking the other, which we know happens uh, frequently. Fourth, uh, this is something that comes very closely from the work of work package six and is about looking at impact in a comparative way between food production sectors. Because if we want to do a sustainability transition, we kind of need to shift not only what we produce, but also what we consume. And economies of scale need to be built 
around those sectors. We were hearing about that today. Profitability comes in a lot of times from optimization, for reaching a certain level of production, and you need to be able to enter um, uh, the markets. You need to develop the value chains and that circular economy markets that will allow us the sort of um, resilience that we need. We also need to look at life cycle assessments. We had very nice examples from South Africa and how this was used to improve what businesses are, are doing. These are incredible tools and having this impact accounting uh, is something that we really should be talking about if we're talking about the sustainability uh, transition and valuing this sort of um, sectors. Hopefully you're still with me. We have done a third. Yay, well done. You made it a third of the way um, through. Recommendation six, growth strategies. We were talking about this in the morning. Is about having a place to go, a target. It's very hard to develop sectors when you actually don't have a target that you want to reach or a plan on how to reach it. And in a lot of the context that we looked at, these are, this is all very loose and you need to be a lot more specific as we see in other sectors, such as renewable energy, right? We need those, that sort of direction and that direction needs to be uh, written in. Targets, growth plans, and in a way that it considers that low traffic aquaculture can deliver on multiple policy objectives, right? It can deliver on food, it can deliver on climate objectives, it can deliver on good environmental status. So that, that really needs to be considered on the directions that we take. Seven, support access to financial services. Yes, so we are running businesses uh, in here. Things need to be financially sustainable. Um, so there's a, a lot of work that needs to be done on bringing investors um, on board, on developing financial mechanisms that are suited um, to, to the sector on recognizing low traffic uh, aquaculture in investment guides, in the um, taxonomy and sustainable activities. There's lots of actions that can be done in here to support this access to financial um, services. Another point that we touched upon this morning is economic reward for ecosystem services. And this can take many different forms. This is our eighth um, recommendations. It can be prior, um, from engaging public or private sectors, but it's about having the systems um, that recognize this, this sustainability, whether they are payment for ecosystem services, training, reductions in taxes, or targeted incentives. Um, but they effectively need to be there, as we have seen, again, in other sectors, when they started, and as we wanted them to, re to go beyond um, a certain point. Nine, optimize and innovate. Um, it's very easy to encourage people to optimize and innovate, um, but we effectively need finance for this, and the finance needs to be uh, in the right form. That R&D needs to look at improvement in performance and value added and creating that, that uh, profitability and really diversifying the product. So quite a lot of the things that we have done um, within the project. And it's about creating that, those innovative business models and ownership models that can, in fact, take LTA um, into the future. Tenth, so we are approaching our two-thirds point. Yay! Resilience. Um, enhance resilience to environmental and socioeconomic change. Yeah, well, quite a lot of business had to survive COVID. They had to survive massive changes in supply chain, massive changes in cost of living. Markets are, there's a lot of changes, cost of energy, lots of changes facing the sector, and this is excluding climate and all those long-term um, pressures. So we really need to look deep into improving risk awareness and risk management capacity into being prepared for uh, this sort of events, sharing data, integrating, um, with big data um, analytics, but also sharing knowledge and support infrastructure for LTA, besides all the finance that we already discussed, because all of it is, is connected. So, entering the last stretch, I think I'm still on time. Super. Um, someone mentioned this this morning also. Uh, social acceptance, I think it was probably David, 
um, raising awareness and social acceptance. LTA or and IMTA are different types of aquaculture than the usual definition that we often um, people can have uh, in their heads. And it's important to raise the profile and really create the space that the subsectors uh, need. And, and this needs to be done through very tailored stakeholder engagement. Different groups of stakeholders need different information, right? Investors need a certain type. Buyers need a different type. Retailers need another type. Communities want to know something else. So we need targeted um, measures uh, in here in terms of informing those different uh, stakeholders. And we need action from a corporate social responsibility. So companies need to be aware of this from, from the start and change how they operate so that they are communicating this and putting all this information uh, forward. And also building their positive social footprints, whether this is the, um, the effect that they have in terms of employment at the local level or the effects on businesses. But those positive social footprints are massively uh, important and something to to put forward. The other aspect in here is that it's not just about the producer, it's the whole value chain. There's a lot of power throughout the value chain. There's a huge power concentration in retailers, right? They're very close to the public. All of those players that appear throughout the value chain can be speaking uh, on the products that they have and the production and can be providing that trust to the consumer and to other people throughout. So in, engaging the whole value chain is absolutely critical uh, in this process. Twelve, improving the participation of producers. We heard this morning that there's a lot of micro companies um, in here. We also heard that from some of the examples that we were talking before about good practice on the role of producers' organizations in driving change on policies that don't work or legislation that needs improvement or just advising each other on how to deal with, with, problems, uh, with problems. So promoting that uh, value chain and farmers organization and cooperation is absolutely key. So much so as valuing the knowledge that producers and, and value chain bring to the table and including them in those participatory uh, processes, right? In the consultations, in the um, delivery of, of the programs, really providing that space for dialogue Certain countries are doing this already exceptionally well. Others have a long way to go. Yeah. Transparency and accountability. So if we want to move to a position of um, where we have sectors that are operating at a high level of sustainability, and if we want to implement marketing standards that allow us to assess that sustainability, we have a long way to go in terms of resolving reporting needs, addressing uh, data gaps, but this is an effort that we need to do if we actually want to move uh, things in a sustainability direction, uh, direction. And of course, there's all the aspects of eco-labels that producers um, are making full use of, um, but even the eco-labels that we currently have could do with some development on, on various um, areas and that development taking into account the different stakeholders' views. Almost there, 14. You're doing really well. No one is asleep, I think. Uh, key point, systems for food safety and quality. So when we, we looked for good practices, there was lots of good practice in terms of uh, control of, of food safety, but there's in, especially in the novel species, there's quite a few things missing. There's gaps in the legislation, there's the issues with iodine, the contaminants, and, and those gaps are real barriers to actually entering the markets. There's also very complex legislation, sometimes in terms of, of novel food. So the regulatory gaps need to be addressed to actually safeguard the, both producers and consumers, right? Consumers need that trust and producers need to know that they are investing on something that is not gonna be blocked in five minutes or is gonna die um, immediately. So we, um, one of uh, the key points in this is encourage the implementation of also uh, trans transparent, reliable, and low cost water quality and food safety monitoring systems that reduce the burden uh, from the producer and in could uh, increase the confidence of, of the consumers. Lastly, the aspects of, yay, capacity building. Um, 
I think we, we keep going over uh, on this over and over again. We actually need people that understand the sector and we need those people uh, in the public sector with the knowledge of um, aquaculture. So we need to build that understanding and I think this, there's a bit of a role for all of us uh, in here. We need to advance specialist expertise, especially in policy makers and, and, and regulators that often move in between fields and have to adapt pretty quickly and learn a new field and it's our role also to, to provide them with this. And of course there's a huge uh, importance in here in terms of investing in professional skills, knowledge, careers in low traffic aquaculture. Um, yeah, finding staff is not easy in a lot of these sectors. There's a huge um, gap uh, sometimes and we need to think about what is gonna happen in the future and we are training these people now and we need to make people capable to take the sector forward um, in a way that is fit for the next 50 years. And I think that's it. I've arrived at the end, well done. Uh, take home message. So there will be 15 take home messages. You can go back to the previous slides. Uh, but uh, what I really wanna get out is that um, Moving it forward will require a lot of um, both coordinated action, but also solutions that are specific to the given context. It's not gonna be one fits all solution. Each country in, or sometimes region needs to see, see what applies to them and tailor it, but it can be done. It's not rocket science, it, uh, science is not something completely far-fetched. We kind of have an indication of how to get there. Um, so just to wrap up, Please check our policy brief, read it over breakfast, send it to your friends. Our, all our deliverables are, are in the website and we are available if there, is, there are any questions. And thank you so much for your time. There it is. Um, I'll put uh, Oza. She's on time as well. Huh? She's on Canada as well, yeah. Oh. We are trendy people. Okay, we'd like to welcome Moses Strand from IVL in Sweden to talk about sustainability and low trophic aquaculture. Welcome, Moses. Thank you. Hopefully, that's the right one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure being here. My name is Osa Strand. Uh, I work as a researcher at IVL, Swedish Environmental Research Institute. And I'm here to talk to you today about the work we've done in Work Package 6 uh, about sustainability in low trophic aquaculture. Yeah, thank you. All right, so um, those of you who heard Philip's introduction, he talked about the challenges, especially yesterday, that the world is facing. Uh, I would like to illustrate this using the planetary boundaries concept, uh, where we actually today have transgressed um, six of the nine planetary boundaries. So we're outside already now, outside the safe operating space uh, for our planets. This is critical stuff. Um, uh, we also know that one of the major contributing uh, factors to this is um, uh, food production. So we can see the major impacts uh, of uh, agriculture, for example, resp being responsible for 80% of the global deforestation, not 29% of the global greenhouse gases. And it continues and continues in terms of land system change, freshwater use. So it's really critical that we find solutions to this problem to supply food for this growing uh, population in the world. So we also know that low trophic species is one of the ways that we can mitigate some of these problems. Um, so what we addressed or tried to work with in Work Package 6 is to develop recommendations on how we can actually increase the low trophic aquaculture production with a net positive impact <laughs> on sustainability in and around the Atlantic Ocean. And this uh, wording, net positive impact, is really critical because no food production sector will ever be without impact. So it's about optimizing the benefits while minimizing the negative impacts. We structured this in five different tasks where we first wanted to establish the context. What do we mean by sustainable aquaculture? Then we address different que uh, questions in different tasks, uh, looking into sustainability issues, risk management and analysis, and also monitoring as tools to uh, analyze and achieve sustainability. 
And finally, we combine all of our findings into recommendations. So this is our output, as Sofina uh, highlighted so well. You can find the deliverables on the Aquavita webpage, at least the ones that have been uh, accepted by the European Commission so far. We have our first deliverable uh, where we produced a framework for sustainability analysis. This was a joint collaboration between IDL and the UNESP. Uh, we have the quantification of ecosystem uh, services, which was primarily led by uh, Isabel and Gonzalo in Portugal. Uh, we have a sustainability analysis, which was primarily led by um, um, Wagner and, and his group in Brazil. Um, and I want to highlight here also that we use the concept of sustainability where the environmental domain um, has uh, precedence over the social and economic uh, perspectives um, as, you know, in accordance with the planetary boundaries without uh, a surviving Earth, we cannot do any business at all. Um, I had a discussion with Richard before and we realized that um, the importance of different sustainability domains will differ depending on what stakeholder you, group you belong to, but we choose uh, the environmental domain to have priority. Uh, we also work with risk assessments, uh, so that's the deliverable 6.4, which was led by IVL. Uh, we produced fact sheets um, uh, as an easy way to communicate uh, information about environmental impacts of low tropic species aquaculture. Uh, Adam at SAMS uh, produced the census of monitoring systems, and then finally, the recommendations, which we just submitted um, on Monday this week. So let's go through some of the major take-home points from each of these deliverables. Uh, we started with the framework uh, for sustainability analysis. And here we started off by identifying what is a desired state, uh, what do we actually mean uh, by sustainable aquaculture, I don't expect you to read all of the text in this slide. I just want to highlight that we used uh, the classical sustainability uh, pillars of economic, environmental, and social, but we also added governance as a specific sustainability perspective that we wanted to dig into a bit more. We also mapped this against one of the most important sustainability frameworks of our time, the SDGs and Agenda 2030, and prioritized the SDGs that we could see that low tropic aquaculture um, was most influential on. Based on these descriptions and these frameworks, we developed an indicator set um, to be able to quantify and describe the sustainability of different production systems. Uh, but we also needed to put this in context, so we also mapped existing and emerging activities uh, of low tropic species aquaculture around the Atlantic. And here we uh, map this according to production system, organism group, um, and a, a bunch of different uh, aspects. There's a report describing this process and the outcomes of it, of course. Then we moved on to actually put this framework into action. Uh, so we started by quantifying ecosystem services. Um, so you can see on this slide that I'm using both the concept of ecosystem services and the concept of nature contributions to people, NCPs. And the reason why I'm using both of them is that ecosystem services to us relates to the services that the environment is providing to us. But we wanted to see both the services and the services that low tropic species aquaculture could produce to society. And the nature contribution to people does exactly that, includes both the services and the services. So we decided to map um, the contribution of low tropic species aquaculture to the nature contributions to people um, concept. And as you can see on the figure, there's a range of different nature contributions to people. Uh, and based on our information, we could see that uh, low tropic aquaculture delivers a range of services uh, to humans and to society. But we could also see that different types of uh, low tropic aquaculture contribute differently to these services. Then from this, we moved on to actually quantify the services or some of the services. Uh, this was a very challenging task. Um, it turned out that there was a lot of data deficiencies. But we managed to get some good analysis done, and we could find uh, that the low tropic aquaculture mitigates instead of contributes to eutrophication uh, effects. But we could also see that these impacts were actually uh, dependent on regional differences, both in the species used, the cultural uh, practices used, um, and other conditionings uh, affecting the, the um, services that we could quantify. In the figure, you can see that we actually put low trophic species in, in relation. Uh, this is a eutrophication index, so 
uh, the potential of contributing to eutrophication um, of low trophic species in relation to other food products. Um, and this is one of the things that at least I am particularly proud of, seeing low trophic species put in perspective to other food. That's really impactful. Uh, and this is the way we need to, to do it, uh, to be able to communicate the benefits of low trophic aquaculture. And you can see that there's negative values for all the low trophic species aquaculture, and it means they are actually extracting nutrients from the environment instead of adding nutrients. We also quantified climate change, um, and you can see I put a question mark after the climate change mitigation. mitigation. Because based on our analysis, we could see that uh, this is a disservice part I was talking about. Even low trophic species aquaculture will contribute with a carbon footprint during the production. But the benefit of a low trophic aquaculture production is that this carbon footprint is so much lower compared to any other food production, especially any other meat production. So you can see the green bars uh, and where it is in relation to other food products again. In general, road trophic aquaculture has a lower carbon footprint than other food production systems. And also we could see that kelp had a neg negligible carbon footprint in comparison to other foods. It's neutral from a biological carbon footprint perspe perspective. So the carbon footprint is actually uh, caused by operational carbon footprints, but it's not negative. That's really important. We also looked into provisioning, uh, and we could see that the product value of uh, LTA products vary greatly between regions and species. Uh, and we could see that provisioning of LTA products is very diverse, uh, and that LTA provide both affordable food and feed products, but also that some of the products are aimed for premium price high-end markets. So there's a range and a great diversity in terms of this service. So from this, we moved on to sustainability analysis. Um, you can see again the different domains we use, the environmental, the social, the economic and uh, governance domains. We deconstructed this into sustainability aspects that was then deconstructed into indicators that were quantified. Uh, we had the ambition to do this work uh, on data from all around the Atlantic, but unfortunately, <laughs> again, we ran into uh, a lot of problems in terms of data deficiencies, but we were super lucky to have uh, Wagner in our group, uh, because you, you, you are here today, and I'm really happy about that. Uh, you've been working in this field for 25 years, um, and you've been building these processes and, and these databases in Brazil to do this kind of analysis. And because of that, you actually managed to do the sustainability analysis for different low trophic species aquaculture systems, although based on data from Brazil. We did manage to get governance data from Europe, from across the Atlantic, um, so that was a, a benefit. Um, and then we also used pet aquaculture systems as reference systems to put things in perspective. So these are some of the major take home messages from that work. Uh, we could see uh, that the culture of extractive species was more uh, sustainable than production of fed species. You can see the macroalgae and the filtering mollusks in the top and to the right. Um, and that the pink bar goes further out on the axis compared to for the fish IMT uh, and the fish monoculture systems. But we could also see that fish cultured in the uh, integrated multitrophic systems were more sustainable than in monoculture. This is also something we heard about yesterday. Um, so you can see that there's linkages between the different uh, case studies, value chains, and the work we've done in the different work packages. Um, and although we've been working with aspects from different perspectives, we are achieving the same results, which strengthen our conclusions. What we also could see that all systems displayed specific strengths and weaknesses related to our specific sustainability domains. So some were really strong in terms of environmental and social uh, sustainability, like the shellfish on the top right, the green uh, graph, while some was really strong in the economic, like the red macroalgae. Um, case. Um, we could also see some general perspectives uh, that enhanced or reduced the sustainability of our four sustain sustainability domains. From the environmental sustainability perspective, we could see that that was improved by use of native species, INT systems, and efficient resource use. In terms of social sustainability, we can see that this was enhanced by a generation of local development and the contribution of low-trophic aquaculture to local food security. 
governance sustainability was enhanced by cooperatives and producer associations, which was discussed in the morning session and also mentioned by, um, by Sophia. We could also see that it was reduced, significantly reduced, by core licensing procedures and social license. Economic sustainability, in turn, was enhanced by generational net income and circularity perspectives. So in conclusion of this work, the Brazilian data really illustrates the applicability of the methodology that we used uh, and that there was a lack of structures for this type of analysis in Europe. And we'll be coming back to this uh, in the recommendations. In the risk assessment work, uh, we used two different approaches, a bottom-up approach where we wanted to explore the industry perspectives um, to risk assessments and a top-down approach uh, where we did scenario analysis to analyze uh, more overarching risks. Um, and then in the end, we combined this to draw some general conclusions. When it comes to the bottom-up perspective, we could see that the stakeholders' risk awareness was focused on operations-related threats uh, exerted upon their production. This is not a surprise. Uh, of course, you are focused on what's closest to your heart. Uh, but this means that there is a need to strengthen the LTA sector's risk management capacity because the overarching risks are not considered in daily operations. So there's no preparation for forthcoming risks. So that's also why we wanted to use a top-down scenario. So here we use trend analysis um, to achieve forecasting and then develop scenarios uh, based on, on this work. Um, and the different dimension we used in, in the scenarios was a continued increase in demand, which was one of the major trends we could um, uh, identify, but also contrasting this against a potential slowdown in demand. Um, and then we contrasted this against uh, minimizing input, which is having an uh, um, environmental perspective on your uh, development of LTA, um, in contrast then to the maximizing output, uh, which is very little environmental concern, production at any cost perspective. So based on this kind of analysis, we could see that changing environmental conditions, uh, such as climate change, uh, will make low traffic aquaculture increasingly challenging to conduct despite a rising demand. Of course, it's very difficult to operate in open ocean systems when you have stochastic environments, extreme weather con uh, events, and, and things like that. But we could also see that changing conditions uh, also present exploitable opportunities. There is a great need for low carbon footprint food, for example, to mitigate the climate change uh, impacts. Uh, but we could also see that scale is a very important aspect in risk identification and analysis. And this is another thing that we later picked up in our recommendations. Finally, yeah, I have some time, so that's good. Um, Adam was working on the monitoring systems. Here we had an approach where we first used the data that we got through the risk analysis work, um, and uh, we analyzed the monitoring data associated from this risk work. Uh, we used questionnaires uh, on, uh, to identify current monitoring practices uh, that was again aimed uh, at the industry. And then uh, Adam did a literature search for, to identify emergent environmental risks. Uh, and based on all of this, we also did a gap analysis, uh, gap analysis to see whether the current day uh, monitoring actually uh, mitigated the risk for, uh, that we had identified. The major findings from this work is that monitoring is indeed crucial for mitigating environmental risks. Um, there are significant resources spent on statutory and elective monitoring, which means that the industry actually choose to do more monitoring than, in, than is required uh, because of the value that it produces uh, to the companies. Uh, we could also see that the major risks today are currently managed effect effectively through the established monitoring practices. But there are a few emerging risks, such as genetic introgression uh, and some emerging risks, for example, um, pollution, uh, that are not effectively mitigated by current monitoring systems. We also identified some opportunities uh, in relation to, to monitoring. Uh, we can see that new technologies can improve the value of monitoring or the cost benefits uh, of monitoring. Uh, for example, AI and machine learning, um, um, Internet of Things. Uh, we also had a lot of discussions about how monitoring could support uh, the development or could be used better in this perspective. 
and we discussed that incorporation of ecosystem services indicators into monitoring could potentially enhance the transparency uh, of uh, LTA operations, uh, which could improve social license, because you can see the direct impact of the activities, um, which often are positive if done correctly. Uh, could enable sustainability analysis. I mentioned before that in the sustainability analysis, there was a lack of structures um, in Europe to actually achieve data to do sustainability analysis. By integrating indicators into the established monitoring systems and extracting data that way, you could actually for free get data to do some parts of the sustainability analysis. Also, uh, we discussed that um, using monitoring and uh, data in a better way could enable the establishment of structures for compensation of performed ecosystem services. This is also something that Sophia mentioned in her, her presentation. So finally, uh, we came to our uh, last deliverable, which are the recommendations. Um, so here we integrated all the work we've been doing in the previous, um, previous deliverables. We extracted our most important findings. Uh, we compared them to identify patterns and relations between them. Uh, we mapped this against sustainability implications um, from low trophic species aquaculture. And then we identified action points uh, to maximize the positive and minimize the negative implications. Based on this, we developed some recommendations. And then we also compared it and linked it to the Aquavite policy brief. So there would be a clear connection between the recommendations. This is just an illustration of what the process looked like. You can see our deliverables on the left-hand side, um, the synthesized recommendations uh, in the center and how they also connect to the planetary boundaries because that is our, that is our goal. How can we um, minimize or reduce the tran transgression of the planetary boundaries uh, so that we again bring our planet back into the safe operating space? So this is uh, a graphic illustration, thanks to Work Package 9 for helping us uh, organizing this, with the sustainability implications of eutrophic aquaculture related to the planetary boundaries. Um, and you can see that there's positive impacts, both in terms of climate change, uh, in terms of freshwater and land system change, biogeochemical flows, uh, which is then the nutrient cycles, nitrogen and phosphorus, um, and um, biodiversity, uh, biosphere integrity and biodiversity perspectives. There we identified both positive impacts, negative impacts, and some aspects that could be both positive and negative, depending on context. So I'm just going to mention very briefly about um, the four major components here that you can see in this figure. Um, so in terms of global warming or climate change perspective, based on our results and the sustainability implication mapping, we saw that low traffic aquaculture can have a positive impact on mitigating global warming through substitution of high carbon footprint production and minimizing greenhouse gas emissions. So if you remember our findings from uh, the quantification of ecosystem services, I said that all food production will actually have a negative impact in terms of uh, there's no such thing um, as a zero carbon footprint um, in, in food production. But uh, the real big benefit here is the substitution of high carbon footprint uh, products to low carbon footprint products. Reduced environmental pollution, and here we're talking both chemicals and nutrient pollution. Low traffic aqu aquaculture production typically results in minimal chemical pollution and present a net removal of nit uh, nitrogen and phosphorus from the environment. And this, of course, can have positive impacts on water quality, and reduced eutrophication effects in specific areas. In terms of biodiversity or biosphere integrity, uh, we, uh, there's um, documentations that low trophic aquaculture production has the potential to support the restoration of marine ecosystems if adapted to the local com uh, context. So here we have local context again. This includes practices that promote biodiversity and ecosystem health. Um, and this is, it, we didn't work on this um, in the Aquavita project, but there is a lot of, of literature actually supporting these statements, um, and they are available in our deliverable, if you're interested to look into this further. Um, and finally, land and freshwater conservation. Um, of course, if you're working with marine uh, sea-based aquaculture, you will have very limited land and freshwater use. 
so low traffic uh, coastal and offshore uh, offshore low traffic aquaculture production can both save space uh, and freshwater resources compared to agriculture production and this can um, mitigate uh, land system change problems. So these are summaries of the eight recommendations that we developed based on all of this information. You can see it's about substitution of high carbon footprint products and um, um, products with high land and freshwater use. It relates to um, the recapture and regeneration of nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, we talk about ocean acidification where seaweed could have a, a great impact. Uh, we talk about localization of low traffic aquaculture um, and how that should be prioritized. Uh, that we need mechanisms uh, to allow economic compensation um, to, to um, uh, actually value the provided ecosystem services. Uh, but we also see that um, there, should, there is a need to develop incentives uh, to design and operate low traffic aquaculture systems specifically to enhance specific ecosystem services. Um, because today it's all about food production, but there is a value also to the ecosystem services provided. And this should really be picked up by policy, uh, because if you want to achieve uh, a change, uh, this needs to be a priority. Um, also, we can see that if you design and operate low traffic aquaculture production systems with a life cycle perspective, you can avoid uh, future problems, emerging uh, issues such as release of plastics and other pollutants. Um, so to summarize all of this, I didn't want to put too much emphasis on the previous slide. Uh, I can send you the recommendations if you want, uh, but I don't want to expose you to death by, by bullet points. So just to summarize this, um, the recommendations address how we can uh, reduce a global food production systems, climate change, uh, climate freshwater use and land system footprints. Uh, how we can capture and regenerate nitrogen and phosphorus and locally mitigate ocean acidification effects. How to recognize and enhance the value of ecosystem services provided by low traffic aquaculture and how we can apply a life cycle perspective to design and, uh, and operate uh, low traffic aquaculture production. Now we come to the really interesting perspective, which is context and scale. Um, so in order to put all of this in perspective and really look into what, what does this really mean in terms of impacts, uh, we did two scenario uh, analysis based on nutrient mitigation. So we did one large scale scenario where we uh, used poultry production as a sort of stepping stone because this is one of the most commonly produced protein um, in the world today. So we got data on how much um, chickens are produ produced around the Atlantic uh, and how much nutrients is released from this production, which is enormous amounts. Um, we also looked into how much nutrients are actually extracted from the current LTA production today, which is ridiculously small compared to the release in the chicken production. It's a fraction. And then we made the assumption, say we want to compensate 1% of the nutrient release from poultry production. Um, and we made the calculations um, and um, to compensate 1% of the nutrient uh, released from poultry production, we would need to have uh, between 9 and 18 percent, uh, uh, sorry, 9 and 18 millions of tons of low traffic aquaculture uh, produced in the Atlantic region, um, depending on if we're aiming for full compensation of nitrogen or phosphorus. And this may sound a lot. But in reality, it's actually not unrealistic. Uh, China alone produces 16 millions of tons of the same species that we have been working on around the Atlantic. So it's actually in the same ballpark. You know, it can be done. And in addition to this, if we produce 9 to 18 millions of tons of low traffic aquaculture, that actually corresponds to 2.7 to 5.3 million of tons of edible product, which could then substitute some of the poultry um, protein that is being produced. And that, in turn, will lead to a, sub a reduction in nutrient release by another 10, 5 to 10 percent. So this really highlights and demonstrates the value of substitution. So by doing this, increasing low trophic species aquaculture, we could actually mitigate between 6 and 11 percent of the nutrient emissions from poultry production. I know there's 
flaws and weaknesses in these in this presentation. It's simplified, um, but it, nevertheless, I think it's important to show these perspectives. Um, we also did a small scale uh, um, calculation based on muscle production in Sweden. In 2018, this production was about 2,000 tons. Uh, we're up to 3,500 tons, so it's it's improving. Uh, but the, in 2018, these 2,000 tons extracted approximately 39 uh, or 35% of nitrogen and phosphorus released from agriculture in this specific area where the major muscle production area is located. So we did a simulation to achieve full compensation for the agriculture release. We would need to upscale to about 5,000 um, 5, to 5,500 tons uh, of mussels, which is completely reasonable for Sweden. Um, we also looked into the current area use. So I was very happy about the Oliver's slide. This Was it this morning? Mm -hmm. When you showed that there is space to expand lotrophic species or seaweed aquaculture uh, production because this illustrates the same thing. The current production, the current area use is about 1% of the available area from a, from a depth perspective. Then there may be other restrictions. Um, and if we upscale to the desired 5,000 tons, uh, it would cover 3% of the available sea area. So it's like nothing, you know, 3% to actually achieve full compensation for another food production sector. I think it's a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah, the take-home message, if done correctly, low traffic aquaculture has the potential to restore ecosystems, may actually compensate for some environmental impacts of other food production systems, and may reduce the pressure uh, on the planetary boundaries. In other words, low traffic aquaculture production gives food that is good for the planet and for us. So you can read more in our deliverables, and before I finish off, I want to say thank you on behalf of the entire Work Package 6 team. Um, and to all the partners in the Aquavita project that has supported us with data and their knowledge. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Osa. Um, we're actually running slightly ahead of schedule, so we have some time for some questions. We might start with the online questions, if there are any. Yes, I think there's someone who wants to say something, so I'm going to allow them to, to speak. Okay. In just one second. Yeah, Anna, I, I think that you can turn on your mic and ask your question. Okay, well, we're getting, waiting for the, the person online to, to, to organize themselves. We'll just see, is there any questions for any of the speakers in the room here? And or is that are those calculations based solely on growth rates and uptake rates of those two components? Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, so this is, as I said, a simplified uh, calculation, but we based it on nutrient uptake potential. Um, so the data that we obtained in the quantification of ecosystem services, how much nutrients is taken up by the seaweeds but it's actually based on the actual production um, in Brazil, in North America, and in Europe uh, for the specific species that we had quantified um, in, um, in the quantification of ecosystem services work. So it's not all lotrophic species, just the species that we actually had data for. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, I have actually
actually a comment, you know, and that is, you know, um, based on the lesson learned from a country where we have been doing research on how to mitigate eutrophication with mussel farming. It is dangerous to link the aquaculture with the agriculture and saying that you can mitigate it even though that's what you're aiming at because it causes resistance within politicians because then it becomes a free ride for the agriculture to continue polluting. It's just a warning, you know. 10 years of research in Denmark has basically been killed within the last five years because of this linkage, because it has been misused by the agriculture for not cutting down the reductions. So be careful when you frame it. <laughs> and uh, remember to emphasize all the other positive things. Uh, I mean, it's just, you know, don't do the same thing as has been going on in Denmark. That's just a warning. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I could just comment on that. Um, this was just one example. We could have done the same for carbon footprint, for example, or biodiversity enhancement. But there is a lot of discussions in terms of carbon credits, nutrient credits, uh, and I think that highlighting these perspectives is super valuable to put things in perspective. Uh, I said I was really happy about the graphs uh, where we could actually see the eutrophication potential carbon footprint of low-trophic aquaculture in relation to other food production systems. But it, because it's, I know it's a problem, uh, but we cannot be responsible for how agriculture develops. We can be responsible for how we promote low-trophic aquaculture. So then it's up to the governance and the politicians to actually not misuse uh, the information that we are, are providing. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, South Africa, Portugal, Portuguese cooperation. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. I, uh, I would like to also comment on this presentation because I think this is very important, as you said, really to put things in perspective because we are very often discussing, uh, you know, low trophic agriculture or agriculture isolate, uh, and not really comparing with other sources of food. And I think this is very important to show that, uh, you know, compare it because we need to continue to feed people. So these are options that we have, options to, that, uh, um, that can contribute to uh, environmental objectives that we also have and the health objectives that we have. But these are viable options and put them in contrast or you know, in the framework of, of food or then we can do with other materials. I think this is very important because sometimes we are discussing just among ourselves and see what is best or not without having the whole context. And since I have this, I want to say that <laughs> uh, we are in IPES, or the Intergovernment Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, is actually doing an assessment at the moment on the nexus of biodiversity, food, water, uh, climate change and health, human health. And really what we are looking for is these examples of options that can, for instance, give food without or with less impacts on the other elements of the nexus. So we are doing this analysis. And I think the results that we have here will be very nice to integrate there. And this second draft of this assessment comes out for review by whoever wants to review it probably the 20th of November, and we'll have a few weeks to do. So I think it's a good time for this network of people really to uh, give some inputs. And I can help you because this is a very long assessment, but I can tell you probably the bits where you could focus uh, to give input. Thank you. Uh, maybe a comment and a question. I think um, everybody in this room agrees about how important ecosystem services are, how useful low traffic aquaculture is. And from that just recent discussion there, it becomes clear to me that 
it's the responsibility of all of us to somehow convince society of what we've just heard and seen. Um, my question, and this could be to anybody here, it could be from industry, ear tip, anybody in this room, is how can we, I mean, we've done our best within Aqua Vitae, but I think we can always do more. I mean, does anybody have suggestions or uh, on strategies of how we can reach society with the message that we've just heard? in a more successful way, even though we've done it with an aqua vitae, perhaps. <laughs> Any doctors? Any goes past the South Africa? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm back. Um, one of the points I mentioned in my presentation is um, making monitoring data available. Um, and I think that this is actually not too far in the future. If we can actually have near real time or real time streams of data um, over long periods of time, and you can actually see how the aquaculture activities impacts the environment, how nature um, ecosystem services are provided, how water quality is improved um, in comparison to reference areas, then you actually get a really good, this should be done for all food production sectors Maybe they don't want to do it, but you know, I think that visualization of impacts, um, we can talk our heads off in terms of saying how wonderful this is, but if you can actually show this in an easy way um, to society before and after, you, but the problem is you need baseline data, establish your farm, monitor, see you know, how the development of the environment looks like. Uh, so I really believe uh, that Adam's work in terms of monitoring and digitalization of monitoring is super important to achieve this. Uh, thank you, great pass. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, uh, there's a quote, I don't know who said it, but if you want to understand what a company cares about, you look at its budget. And I think if you want to get people caring about ecosystem services, you've got to value them. And whether you believe it's a, it's a good thing or bad thing, that economic value in, of eco ecosystem services is really important. People pay attention, it becomes a budget line, it becomes something people talk about. And so it's not only a financial instrument which needs to be developed, it propagates into being a social instrument because it's something people can relate to. If I talk to somebody about kilos of carbon, they, 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 my wife turns blank and says, that's nice, dear. But if we start talking about uh, numbers and budget lines and it becomes embedded in every financial uh, company's uh, interests to, to value these ecosystems, then it propagates through. And so I, I think creating the financial markets for ecosystem services for low trophic agriculture is really, really important, not just to make the, 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 the companies more sustainable, but to to increase that social awareness of the value that that that, that the uh, uh, that agriculture can bring, so that's yeah. Um, I firmly believe, and I want to really attach just a little bit further thought onto that whole thing. In the end of the day, uh, it's a PR exercise, and the PR exercise is about advertising making sure that we actually bring across the message of sustainability and where we are going to society in general. Then attaching to that the benefit of low trophic aquaculture and how it can contribute to that so that it does filter through to your markets. I mean, I'm a businessman, we follow the money. If the money is in sustainability, that's where everybody's gonna go. I think that we live in a world that is like a, a, in the closed system. Thus, what is absorbed here is return to the environment after the consumption. Thus, it's very difficult to say that uh, we have uh, ecosystem services uh, like this. Uh, and these numbers also, I think that is not totally trustable because it's difficult to measure these numbers. 
But uh, uh, putting uh, in a perspective, I think that it's interesting. But in my opinion, what is more important uh, uh, for low trophic species is that we have uh, systems that uh, need uh, less natural resource to be produced. You can produce food, you can produce other kind of, uh, not only food, but a lot of products, raw material and energy with uh, uh, lower uh, use of natural resource. Thus, we extract less from the nature. And in addition, we have more circularity in the low trophic aquaculture system. And if you have more circularity, uh, it's interesting because it's a regenerative system. Thus, you can regenerate uh, some uh, uh, for, uh, uh, the, the nutrients and the material that we are using. And thus, uh, it's better for the planet because we don't need to extract more. In my opinion, the, the most important thing is that we need to extract less resource from the nature uh, for low trophic species. And it's more regenerative. In addition, when we use producers like macroalgae or, or microalgae, uh, we use solar energy. Thus, we use less energy from the environment. This is the most important points, in my opinion, for sustainability that put the low trophic species in the high level. Uh, if I can just... add a comment on online before we, we proceed, Adrianos wrote, we should make arguments that subsidies should be funneled towards more sustainably produced foods, just to add to the discussion that you were having. Okay. Um, just from a consumer point of view, I think it would also go a long way to educate consumers. I hear what Penel says, not putting agriculture as opposed to low tropic um, aquaculture, but to educate consumers as to the effect that their choices have on the environment. And once you have that education and people can decide where they spend their money, it will decrease the market for the, for the higher, um, the, the product that has a negative influence on the environment and increase the demand for more positive products. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, but I also think that there's a lot that can be done from a governmental perspective. I, I really like Adriana's comment there about the incentives. Uh, I would call them incentives. You know, in Norway, they have a tax on sugar. Uh, why don't we have a tax for high carbon footprint foods? Uh, because that could really you know, if you can impact the price range of different products, you could target or direct consumers <coughs> towards the products that you actually want them to consume. Sugar tax, alcohol tax, you know, high taxes on things that are not good for us or our planet that would drive the consumers towards the right products. Uh, so from a governmental perspective, there's also things that can be done. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And then on a fine note of taxing things that are not good for us, our coffee and cake should be outside. And um, <laughs> more pet oh. and sugar. <laughs> Hold on. One more. One more we want more. And that's it. The last word for this session. On my way down, I just want to say I support uh, the comments from Wagner because what's the most efficient converter of solar energy on the planet? Nothing man's made, but algae. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was just going to come, uh, sorry for taking the time, on that last point on communication and who should be communicating this. And I completely agree that we should be talking to consumers. And I think that's absolutely half of, of the equation because people will relate to this through the products they are buying, right? So this links back to what I was saying about the message coming from retailers those putting the products out there, but it also brings other aspects like famous chefs. You know, the people, no, it's true, the people leading the narrative on this is the documentaries on Netflix, is <laughs> those ways of reaching people. So you're connecting through product, but you're also introducing the process because we need them 
to understand. So we need to start thinking creatively about who are those that have the trust and have the reach to do this communication far better than we probably could. So, yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks everyone for participating in this uh, first session. We're going to take a short break for coffee and we'll be returning at 10 past three, so 15.10, okay? See you then. Thank you.